So this came about um, as a result of Mark Ash, um, who is the exec director for Climate Environment and Customer. He went on his carbon literacy, um, carbon literacy training and one of his pledges was to set up an internal climate network. Um, there's quite a lot of work going on around climate at Essex County Council, but sometimes it can be quite hard um, to see the full picture and know what other teams are doing and what's being delivered. So we're hoping that this network will kind of be a space to share everything that's going on and allow other colleagues to join up and work together um, to, to, look, to deliver some of these actions. Um, and we're also hoping that by sharing some of the great work that's going on, we will inspire others to also take action. Um, there's there's a lot of work being done here, but there's still more that could, there's still a lot more that could be done um, at ECC, um, not just within the climate environment department, but across the organisation. And really, climate action needs to be a part of every conversation at work. So we're really hoping that members of this network will really advocate for climate within their own roles and teams. And then finally, we are going to be offering support for people who've done their carbon literacy training um, or in the process of doing their carbon literacy training. Um, for those who have been um, for those who've been doing who have done their carbon literacy training already, they'll know that there'll be a pledge aspect um, where you'll pledge to take action individually and within a work setting. So we're really hoping that uh, this network uh, will give people the support to turn those pledges into reality. Um, so yeah, the, that's just a very, very whistle-stop tour of what the network will offer, but ultimately we want this to be employee led so we're really happy to hear suggestions from everybody else um and and just take it as it comes um but for now we will crack on with the event so i am going to hand over to reverend roger morris um who is now going to talk to us about the importance of climate change over to you roger Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Roger. I'm the Bishop of Colchester. Uh, I'm kind of like a fancy dress version of an area manager, really. I work for the Church of England and I cover an area going from uh, Stansted Airport up to beyond Saffron Walden, across to Harwich, down to Clacton, taking in Colchester, Braintree and Whitton. Uh, I've been working for the church for 30 years, but I actually trained as an inorganic chemist. Uh, so I have a sort of scientific background. Uh, I'm the lead for the environment uh, for the Diocese of Chelmsford and in fact I've just come out of a, a carbon net zero meeting that we're having uh, trying to get the Church of England carbon net zero by 2030, uh, which is quite a task. Uh, and I also am a member of the Essex Climate Action Commission. Uh, now if we can have the next slide. Uh, Lovely. What I'll do is I'll just go through some mildly depressing stuff around why we need climate change, uh, but just to set the tone, hopefully, for, for everything else. Uh, we've just had recently published the, the IPCC report, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and, and that is saying things with a, 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 an absolute degree of certainty, really, that, that basically... Um, what we are doing as human beings is causing global warming um, uh, and that the surface temperature over that time period, it says, has gone up by 1.1 centigrade. Uh, and there are rapid changes to all sorts of uh, environments across the globe, vulnerable communities uh, who have contributed least to uh, to global warming are actually suffering. So Mozambique at the moment with terrible floods and things like that, all kinds of things happening across the globe as a result of human activity. So the next slide. Um, we've missed one, I think, have we? Uh, there should be, that's it, that's lovely. Um, thank you. Um, this is really important because this talks about NDCs. Um, NDCs are the nationally determined contributions. They're at the heart of the Paris Agreement, 
and uh, that they're all to do with the achievement of, of the long term goals of the Paris Agreement. They embody the efforts by each country to reduce national emissions and to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Uh, so the UK has committed to reducing uh, economy wide greenhouse gas emissions by at least 68 percent by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. Um, I have to say the white paper uh, issued today, uh, the government has come in for some criticism as to whether the white paper actually holds to its Paris um, agreement commitments. Um, but actually what these things tell us is the more that we don't do now, the more we will not be able to undo. And um, uh, we can put a lot of store by technologies that may come in to do carbon capture, but those technologies do not fully exist yet. So the best thing we can be looking at is reducing greenhouse gas emissions, full stop. Uh, next slide. And uh, the IPCC report says that the choices and actions implemented in this decade will have impacts now and for thousands of years. It's really sobering. This is a crucial time to be alive and to be active. What we do now has a huge impact going forward. Uh, so just to look at this in terms of what it means, the next slide uh, produced by the Worldwide Fund for Nature, talks about what the effect of uh, one and a half centigrade uh, temperature rise within this time period. So um, this is our best case scenario. It's also talking about ice-free summers in the Arctic every hundred years. It's talking about 46 million people being impacted by sea level rises. It's talking about 1 billion people being exposed to severe heat waves. It's talking about losing 6% of insects, 8% of plants and 4% of vertebrates. This is our best case scenario. Uh, if you just turn the dial up a bit to two centigrade of global warming. Uh, so if we go on to the next slide, uh, this is what you see. All of a sudden, uh, it's not it's not 6% um, uh, of insects, but 18% of insects, 16% of plants, 8% of vertebrates lost, um, 2.7 billion people exposed to severe heat waves, uh, ice-free summers in the Arctic Ocean every 10 years. Uh, the changes just with that half a centigrade are massive. But what about Essex in particular? Uh, let's go on to the next slide. 70 years ago, Essex suffered huge floods, the floods of 1953. Overnight, on January the 31st, 1953, a huge storm pushed a great tide into the East Coast, which breached Essex seawalls in 300 places and spelt disaster for residents along the North and South Essex coast. A total of 104 people died in Essex, including 35 in Jaywick, eight in Harwich, and 61 across South Essex. 59 people from Canvey Island died in the flood and 13,000 were evacuated from their homes. Could it happen again? The answer is yes. The two major causes of global sea level rise are thermal expansion caused by warming of the ocean. So as wa water gets warmer, so it expands. Uh, and increased melting of land-based ice, such as glaciers and ice sheets. The oceans are absorbing more than 90% of the increased atmospheric heat associated with emissions from human activity. What does that look like in Essex? Well, uh, next slide. Uh, Climate Central have produced a map that shows that huge swathes of the Essex coast could be below sea level by 2050. Uh, the interactive tool, if you go onto the Climate Central website, shows that uh, that actually most of Tilbury uh, and even Lakeside Retail Park could be underwater by 2050. Canby Island would be lost. A lot of prime agricultural land in the Denji will be underwater. Brightling Sea will be an island and Mersey Island will be half the size and cut off from the mainland. Uh, the effects in Essex by sea level rise could be huge. Uh, next slide. 
but of course, it's not just uh, sea level rise. It's things like uh, flash flooding, um, increased flood risk inland as well. Number of homes at risk of flooding could double between now and 2050. And, and that is through uh, us having warmer, wetter, wetter winters uh, and increasing rainfall that has nowhere to go. So our floods, uh, it floods our roads and it floods our homes. Uh, next slide. Lovely. Um, of course, the floods in winter are mirrored by drought in summer. Hotter, drier summers means that Essex already suffers from water scarcity and the pressure on water supplies will increase year on year on year. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Meteorological Office, uh, the Hadley Centre scientists, found that the chances of extreme high temperatures in parts of the UK could increase significantly by the end of this century. The research paper showed that the highest temperature, and um, we had a 40 degrees centigrade recorded temperature last summer. Um, and, and the question is whether, whether exceeding 40 degrees centigrade is, is now more likely? And the answer it is. Uh, under the current chance, uh, the, the current sort of levels, uh, the chance of seeing days above 40 degre degrees centigrade by 2100 uh, could see them every three to four years. A huge heap that we're now having to deal with. Um, the author of the report, Dr. Nicholas Christidis, said, uh, we found that the likelihood of extreme hot days in the UK has been increasing and will continue to do so during the course of the century, with the most extreme temperatures expected to be observed in the south east of England. That includes us. Climate change has already influenced the likelihood of temperature extremes in the UK and the chances of seeing 40 degrees C days in the UK about 10 times higher. Heat waves caused a record 2,556 excess deaths in Britain in something like 2019, uh, as the country was struggling to contain the coronavirus pandemic as well. According to a government estimate published uh, at the time. So, so heat waves causing deaths, water scarcity, all those kind of things, and the hits just keep on coming. If you look at the next slide, our land uh, is not managed with a view to absorbing the heavier winter rainfalls. So what happens is the water runs off the land, taking soil with it. The water is then not available when we need it in the summer. So we're actually suffering from land degradation already. Our homes, our businesses, our transport infrastructure are damaged every year by flooding and then by severe drought. Uh, and it's not just our parks and our farms that are affected, uh, that actually the hotter and drier summers um, driven by global heating mean that the ground under our homes will shrink and crack. The key areas affected are London, Essex, Kent, and a swathe of land from Oxford up to the Wash. And that's because the clay formations underlying these areas are most vulnerable to losing moisture. In a medium scenario for future emissions, the, this area of Great Britain uh, could see increased risk of clay related subsidence by something like a third from between 2020 to 2030 and triples by 2050. About a million homes were at risk in 1990, and that rises to 2.4 million homes in 2030 and 4 million in 2070. Uh, I'm actually dealing with a church at the moment at Little Wigborough, which is on the salt flats, and the, basically the walls are coming apart from each other because the land underneath that church has dried out so much. Uh, next slide. And if that's not bad enough, globally, there's going to be a shortage of certain things like, for example, uh, potatoes. Uh, by 2050, the global production of potatoes could decrease by as much as 9%. Rice, uh, which could drop by about 5.5% if temperatures rise by uh, one and a half centigrade. 
wheat and maize are included, uh, but also tragically, uh, bananas, um, uh, where diseases spread more quickly in hot weather, cocoa, uh, the Cote d'Ivoire in Ghana, in West Africa, responsible for half the world's cocoa production, and the region is experiencing erratic rainfall and hot winds. Cocoa beans only grow well in specific conditions, and they need consistent temperatures, high humidity and regular rainfall. And coffee, Ethiopia, which is Africa's top coffee producer, could potentially lose 25% of its coffee yields by 2030. Uh, so not only are we dealing with the things in Essex, but we haven't got the coffee and the chocolate uh, to at least uh, make life tolerable. Uh, next slide. Uh, the other thing, of course, that will happen is that we will see more uh, migration to other parts of the world as people become displaced from parts of the world that are uninhabitable. So the Institute for Economics and Peace uh, estimates that around 1.2 billion people could be displaced by climate change over the next 30 years as floods, fires and heat waves become more common. Uh, but I've not just come on here to paint a picture of floods and droughts and high temperatures and soil degradation and food scarcity and a worsening migrant crisis. They're all highly possible. Uh, but I also want to advocate for the fact that we can do something. Uh, so uh, just this last slide shows uh, something that Jules Pretty uh, put together, 30 things that we can do for 2030. Uh, and the big things here, changing our diet, installing solar panels, getting an electric vehicle, uh, walking or taking public transport, uh, flying less, these things can have a massive, massive effect and impact. Uh, and the reasons that I've just covered are the reasons why we then need to take these kind of things seriously and why I'm delighted that you're launching this network. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. And yeah, gave a very, very good overview of the crisis which is currently facing us. Um, so I am now going to hand over to Sam Kennedy, who is going to talk a bit about what action is being taken um, at Essex County Council. So over to you, Sam. Thanks, Roz. Uh, and we'll just skip immediately to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, uh, I, I can't tell you um, how much of a journey we've been on in Essex over the last few years. We have made mad strides in really taking this agenda, this crisis seriously and putting in place a proper plan uh, and taking action against that plan um, to really start to tackle uh, uh, climate change right here, right now, where we live, where we work. Um, Roger mentioned that he was a, a commissioner. So it, it, we set up um, the Essex Climate Commission, and I hope that some of you at least will have heard of that. Um, it brings together a huge range of uh, expertise. So we're very lucky to have um, academics from all three of our institutions in Essex, um, as well as um, uh, a UNEP uh, scientist, um, uh, business leaders, uh, community leaders like uh, Bishop Roger, um, the uh, uh, councillors, stakeholder groups, huge range of, of, of expertise and experience, both at a local and a national level, have come together to help us think about what does climate really mean for us here in Essex? Um, and some of the research that the Bishop uh, Roger referenced in his presentation was pulled out in, in the exploration that the Commission did to really understand what this meant for us here in Essex. But critically, the Commission in July 21 published a report, Net Zero, Making Essex Carbon Neutral, which sets out what are the actions that need to be taken between here and 2050 to actually get us to a place where we are net zero. So we've talked about the scale of this challenge and it can feel really overwhelming and it can feel as though we've no idea where to make a start. But actually, the Commission report just strips all of that away and says, actually, there are clear things that we can do right now. And the focus of this report is for action in this 
next decade because the science very clearly tells us that um, the years up to 2030 are absolutely critical for making that difference. Um, and they're not they're not reliant on new things being invented or, or, or things that we haven't thought of yet. We have the technology, we know what needs to be done, we have the, the tools to do it, we just need to actually drive the action forward. Um, so a huge amount of work, a massive amount of evidence pulled together to underpin these recommendations. And if you haven't had a look at it, I would really strongly recommend that you do. It's online, the link is in the website. Um, it's really well worth having a, a skip through. Uh, next slide, please. And then in response to those recommendations, Essex County Council took all of the themes in the Commission report and went, right, what are we doing to actually start to make some of these recommendations come true, what really deliver against these in Essex? And in November in 2021, we published our Climate Action Plan. It's really detailed. And so two things like the land use challenge that uh, uh, Bishop Rogers so clearly articulated, that soil degradation, the increased flooding, the water scarcity. There's a whole plan in there to increase the level of green infrastructure that we have in the county to help our landscape absorb that water when it falls, hold it for when we need it in the summer. Um, there's a whole raft of work around improving our own estate. So we made a commitment as an organisation to be have a net zero estate by 2030. And there are the, the um, uh, estates team are working on that right now. What does that really look like? We've already done a lot of work to our estate. So one of the buildings that uh, is in my portfolio is the uh, Essex Record Office. We've put in a heat pump. We've put solar panels on the roof, really making strides to make that building uh, have as small a footprint as possible and that's being replicated right across our estate so that work is in train but also thinking about better planning standards a huge amount of work has been done to uh, increase the level of expert guidance on the Essex design guide for planners and working with developers to really make that reality and we have our first ever uh, net zero housing estates coming forward in Essex they're actually being built right now Huge amount of work done on energy, uh, too much to talk about, but uh, just a couple of things. We've got an award winning scheme to help communities set up their own community energy uh, organisations and drive investment in renewable energy in their own local areas. So we've got community groups who are currently supporting solar panels on their local school. Really great to see that and support people in being able to take those actions in their own community. Huge uh, raft of work around active travel, really stepped up investment in active travel, uh, uh, maintaining uh, also in increased uh, uh, funding to maintain our cycle, existing cycle network. We're really working on that amongst a whole raft of other uh, transport initiatives. Um, uh, Kevin Bentley chairs Transport East, which is the regional body that sets the strategic frame for transport planning and Transport East have committed to be net zero in transport in Essex by 2040. That is an extraordinary commitment that is going to drive a huge amount of change in how we move goods, services and ourselves around the county. Waste, the Cinderella of the environmental world, everyone forgets about it. Um, but actually, we all buy a lot of stuff and we throw away 450,000 tonnes of waste in Essex every year. That has to go somewhere. Uh, anything we can do to drive that down is, is an absolute win from a carbon perspective, from a consumption perspective, but also from a pollution perspective. And then our, our, our uh, economic growth teams are working on how we can unlock jobs and opportunities from the transition to net zero. So there's a very clear call to action and very good reasons why we urgently need to take action. But actually, with that, that challenge comes an opportunity to develop new industry, to, to, to develop uh, new skills and to develop new opportunities for businesses and, and, and residents in Essex. We really need to make sure that Essex is at the forefront of that. Um, and because of our, our fantastic climate action plan, we have been awarded an A rating in the Carbon Disclosure Project, which is a global benchmark. 
um, for organisations and areas taking action um, uh, uh, to properly tackle um, climate change. And we're the only county council in the UK to have achieved that um, rating and one of only a handful of local authorities at all in the UK. Really marking us out as, as taking a proper lead in this space, which is a massive step forward from where we were three or four years ago. Um, so we have made real running and, and, and I'm incredibly proud to be part of uh, that journey. But despite all of that, there is still, we're still at the beginning. We're still at the beginning of all of the things that we need to do. Um, and to really drive um, delivery of all of the recommendations set out by the Commission, we really need as much support and help as we can. We need absolutely everybody to think about what they can do, where they are, in their team, in their home, in their community. Um, so just next slide, please. Um, Bishop Roger uh, put up, uh, Jules Pretty is the chair of the commission, that's his 30 things, but the, these are articulated uh, in more detail in um, the advice packs, they're online. Um, if you know anyone who runs a small business, the business advice pack is there. If you're involved in your local school, the school's advice pack is there. The resident advice pack will help you think about things that you can do in your own space. And we're also launching in May a carbon app, which I'm also hopeful will be will be really helpful. We're very excited about that. Um, but really, this is a kind of call to action to kind of get involved uh, and be the climate leader in your own space. Take your carbon literacy training if you haven't done it uh, and uh, really, really look forward to hearing your ideas for, for, for what you're doing. And I'm going to hand back to Roz. Great. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, yeah, that was a great overview of everything that Essex is doing. Um, and as Sam touched on, um, there is still more to be done. Um, so we're now going to go over to our sort of case study section of uh, the session today and uh, the two case studies we've got um, are quite important because actually um, they don't sit and they haven't come from the sort of environment and climate world um, so these are teams that sit outside of that directorate um, so I'm hoping that it will inspire you and show you that you don't have to be working in this space to still take action on climate so um, I'm now going to hand over to Stephanie. Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, if we could go to the next slide, please. And so, hi, yeah, I'm Stephanie O'Dowd and I work in the Workforce Development Team and we sit within the Education Directorate at ECC. Um, and our main role is to facilitate training events for education establishments across Essex, so like schools or preschools and childminders. So we organise over 200 events a year, and that includes face-to-face -face events or virtual events, um, and that can range from really large conferences to like small cluster meetings. And so today I'm going to be talking to you about an event checklist that we created with Climate Action and um, that anyone in ECC can use. Um, but first I thought I'd tell you how it kind of came about. So um, I recently attended an event where Sam was speaking and it was so inspiring, but she shared some very shocking statistics about climate change and really emphasised the importance of making these changes in Essex. And then Sam left to go to a different event. And once Sam had finished speaking, lunch was served. And if I'm honest, it was a sea of single use plastic. Everything was individually packaged. There was plastic water bottles, the sandwiches, the fruit, everything. And the contrast between what Sam had just said to us and the sight that we could see it really stuck with me and just made me realise how easily we could make ch changes to reduce our own carbon footprint in house and how we can be leading by example. So I reached out to the climate action team and we created a checklist of ways to reduce the climate impact of our events. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I've got a task for you all. Um, if you could think back to the last large event that you attended, it could be in your professional life or personal, like a wedding or a conference, um, or even just a meeting. And think, if you can put in the comments section, just one way that you think that event could have been better for the environment, I'd be really interested to see what you say. I know Roz can't see the chat, so I will shout 
them out as they come through. Thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> I don't see anything has come through yet. I hope that's because you're all thinking about it. There are there are quite a few on the chat. Shall I read some out? Oh, I'm not see seeing them? it. Yeah, maybe I can't see it. So, um, uh, so let me just skip on through. Uh, meat free lunch, glass bottles and jugs of water, transport, making better use of public transport or car sharing. Uh, someone else that would travel with colleagues who live near me and go in one car. No water bottles and a meat free lunch. Lots of plastic branded promotional goods. Bring your own lunch. No plastic bottles. People encouraged to take home leftovers, public transport options. Take away the plastic freebies. That was me, the wristbands. Oh. Choose a venue <laughs> that can be reached by public transport. No plastic cups to drink from. Pulse based meals. No printed handouts. No buffet. Lots of wasted food locally sourced food, remote dialing available where possible, accessible without a car. The recent wedding I went to had, had plants at table decorations that they took home. Nice. Yeah, nice. Use a uh, natural light, name stickers rather than lanyards, located by an, uh, an accessible location, uh, located somewhere accessible by public transport. A car share app, does anyone know if this exists? Uh, if using paper handouts, provide recycling bins, meet in the metaverse. Thank you. That's great. Um, you've basically written the checklist again, so that, that's really helpful. Um, next slide, please. So um, I've just shared on this slide just um, a glimpse of the checklist. The proper one can be accessed through the Climate Network, and I'll put the link into the comments. Um, in a second for you. So this can be used across ETC for all types of events or meetings. Um, I'm not going to read through it all, you can see it um, yourselves, but if you, I mean a lot of what you've said in the comments is covered here. One that I'd never thought about but it's such a quick win and so easy to implement is catering should be vegetarian as default. It was honestly something I'd never thought of and now we can we can take that forwards um, and some of them yeah some of them are obvious, some of them not so much. So yeah, like I say, I'll put that link in the chat for you. And next, oh, sorry, I just wanted to also say that this isn't a list of rules that we all must follow. It is a list of things to consider where appropriate and customer need will always come first. But also it is a way to start meaningful conversations with our colleagues across the county, but in and outside of ECC. I think having those conversations with venues, asking them about their recycling bins and their food waste, it's going to inspire others to have those conversations too, which is really exciting. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to share with you um, sort of the case study of where, where we're going to be using this checklist first. So we organise an annual event called the EYFS conference, and this will be our first event utilising this checklist. So I'll just give you some examples of how we're doing that. So we're holding the event at Anglia Ruskin University, which is a short walk from the train station and bus stops. We haven't used this venue before, so we're really excited about everything it can offer. It has an on-site wormery for leftover food and it has recycling bins for glass and plastic and paper. We have opted for jugs of water instead of um, individual bottles. And instead of printed agendas given out on the day, we have created an electronic conference pack um, that can be accessed by phone or tablet by the delegate. The stallholders that are coming on the day, we've asked them to car share where appropriate and to consider use of single use plastics and promotional items. We have opted for a vegetarian menu by default 
And for name tags, we're looking into biodegradable sticky labels. But we've also been told about seed labels that our delegates may be able to plant afterwards to grow flowers, um, which I love because it fits really nicely into this year's theme of wellbeing for. But that is everything from me. Um, if you've got any questions, you can email me at Workforce Development. I'll put my email address in the comments box as well. And thank you for listening. I'll pass back over to Ros. Great. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, yeah, so as Stephanie mentioned, um, any questions, please do get in touch. Um, but we have quite a lot of time available at the end of this session for questions and discussions. So feel free to either put something in the chat or just raise your hand once we're done. So I'm now going to hand over to Barbara, who's going to talk through a very different type of project, but a very, very interesting one. So um, Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Barbara Wingrove. I'm an occupational therapist and I manage a small team of occupational therapists um, in Children and Families Essex County Council. We work with those children and young people that have long term and often life limiting disabilities. Uh, the role of occupational therapy is really focusing on overcoming barriers within the home environment to promote independence, increase choice and control and reduce risks. The remit of my team really is to make recommendations for and oversee large builds to uh, service users homes, the family home. The other part of our remit is actually the prescription of very, very specialist equipment for our children and young people to help with seating, bathing, toileting, etc. Next slide. I um, had the opportunity to introduce on a temporary basis occupational therapy assistance into my team last year. I came up with an idea that actually bringing um, OT assistance into the team would not only help with our throughput of cases, but would also help with a number of other factors. The project was called Review, Retrieve and Recycle. The OT assistants complete reviews on equipment we've prescribed. That equipment is retrieved back into our warehouse and is recycled out to other children and young people that need this. It was a project that had unexpected benefits. Next slide. This is um, an example of the paediatric or children's warehouse, a very glamorous location where I spend a lot of my time. Um, and as you can see, it is full to the rafters of all of this specialist equipment. For example, one piece of seating can cost anywhere from £2,500 upwards. Um, and if a piece of seating is not ordered from new and recycled, it that may be of no monetary value at all or a few hundred pounds a, only. What we were finding is that actually we were ordering, I, I have oversight of the children's equipment budget, which was rapidly rising, but also ordering from new means that our children and young people have to wait for a very, very long time for the equipment to actually be prescribed. So the outcome of this project has, um, I think if we go to the next slide, we'll show the benefits. In six months, the OT assistants have recycled £87,000 worth of equipment, which is phenomenal. The impact is that this equipment comes back very quickly into Essex Equipment Services. It's decontaminated and it, then it goes out to the next child or young person that needs it. So not only um, is my healthy, is my equipment budget looking particularly healthy because we're not ordering from new the whole time. It means um, the feedback that we have from the families we work with um, has been extremely positive because the children and young people are getting the equipment very, very quickly. So that was £87,000, um, I think a couple of days ago when I gave the slides to Ros. We're actually at £89,000 today. So um, this is a 
equipment that the occupational therapists are identifying to be collected because the child no longer needs it or they've outgrown, it comes back into stores, it's decontaminated and then it goes out to the next child. Um, the benefits have been outstanding. Equipment is more readily available because it's on the shelves. It can be provided to the child or young person very, very quickly because the prescribers can actually reserve an item and it can be placed for immediate delivery. I think most probably one of the biggest impacts is that the prescription of our equipment really does improve the health and well-being benefits to some of our children and young people with the most complex of physical disabilities. Um, another benefit, as I've said before, my equipment budget remains healthy and basically we're buying a lot less new pieces of equipment um, and recycling rates in line with everyone's Essex. So it's a pilot scheme. It's a pilot scheme for 12 to 18 months um, and I will be presenting it to the relevant boards. I think it's the Children's Transformation Board um, in the next couple of months to actually look at the long term benefit of this scheme. And I think we may be there. Great. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, and I think this project is a fantastic example where, um, you know, climate wasn't always the sort of primary benefit. Really, the main benefit for this project is um, the young children who benefit from the increased turnaround in, you know, getting their equipment out to them. Um, and but actually the fact that all this equipment is being reused instead of, you know, ending up in landfill or sitting in people's homes for years and years until it's degraded. Um, that's a fantastic secondary benefit as well. So, yeah, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, thank you. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. So that actually leads us on to sort of the end of our presentations today. Um, I hope it's been interesting. Um, we've heard from quite a lot of different people and quite a lot of different topics around climate. Um, but we wanted to build in time in this session to just have some, well, firstly, for anyone to ask any questions um, that you may have um, and also maybe start a bit of a discussion um, around what you could maybe take from this, um, what you can maybe gain from the network um, and things that you could do in your own teams. Um, I have a couple of uh, a couple of pointers on screen there um, for people to think about, but it would be great if if uh, someone could kick off the conversation. Feel free to just pop something in the chat. Um, not that I can see that. I'll probably keep my screen up for a few minutes and then I will stop sharing so I can actually see what's going on. Um, yeah, feel free to pop something in the chat and we'll pick it up. Um, or if you are feeling brave, please do raise your hand um, and happy to answer any questions. Or like I said, if you'd like to put any suggestions out there for what you think your team could do um, or if you'd like any support with anything. Um, yeah, please do. Please do jump in. So I, I think that there is quite a good discussion going on the chat around kind of venues. Um, uh, and, uh, it, might, it might be useful to 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 share kind of what 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 are the transport options for various kind of ECC venues? Because um, I think I think uh, that that's something that that people are struggling with. But um, there's a there's a hand up, Ros from Gavin Leonard. Gavin. Hello there. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Cool, cool. So, uh, so listening to what's been said, we are initially looking to change behaviours within ECC, uh, but I'm wondering, have we got any thought into how we're going to change behaviours of, of the residents? Because that it's it can get quite quite demoralising, fighting the good fight and looking around and seeing the world turn into dust around you. Um, have we got a, an approach to that? 
So I'll, I'll pick that up, Gavin. I mean, I think most of our climate action plan, so whilst there is a lot of work going on internally, um, most of our climate action plan is externally facing. So uh, planting uh, trees right across, we are uh, in uh, the, the Essex Forest Partnership is committed to planting a million trees in Essex over the, the next couple of years by 2025. Um, <clears throat> giving people different transport options. So the chat has kind of highlighted the, the real difficulties with public transport. So really trying to introduce new approaches, things like the DigiGo bus, uh, giving people better active travel solutions, increasing park and ride options. All of those things are, are things that are aimed at residents and businesses. Um, increasing uh, uh, options for uptake of renewables, um, both large scale and on people's roofs. So we've got a bulk buy discount scheme for people, for residents, which actually has been incredibly popular. Um, in terms of uh, outreach to businesses, I, I highlighted the advice packs, but actually there's a huge level of engagement work that goes on, both with um, other public sector bodies, so working with districts and boroughs, with the NHS, with the universities, to collaborate on climate action across the public estate, um, working with businesses to help them, uh on our transition um and particularly working with our supply chain through our own procurement and advice to our supply chain on the things that they can do and that's a that's a continually evolving piece of work and then a huge amount of engagement work with schools with community groups with residents with parish councils um uh, to drive behavior change so uh i would really encourage you to have a look at the action plan uh, and if there's a particular area you're interested in, I can kind of signpost you to stuff that's already happening. Or if you can spot a gap, be delighted to hear your ideas on how we could fill that and what else we could do. Um, so I think next we've got Hannah. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to say this, is, this has been really brilliant. It's really good that we've had those kind of um, those figures initially to set it out, but then also to hear what what how good we are doing and how how we're doing, and then to be able to think about what we can do better. And I think it's um it can be really overwhelming to think about climate change and kind of what you can do as a person. So it's really positive to hear what um what we're doing at Essex and then what we can do. Um so these are in no this these are kind of challenges that I feel we face. Um one of them is virtual I've heard about people now having the cameras on and those meetings although it's saving the travel which is brilliant um that there's a, a massive impact with people um working virtually so I don't know if that's something I'll explore myself just to kind of find out a bit more but anything that is is something that people know about or we can look into and um, because I also think sometimes there's you want to have that interaction with people and speak over the um, so if you're working from home or something so you can actually see people there's a massive benefit to that but if there's going to be a, a climate impact I think it's something we should think about um, for Essex. Um, the other thing I think is about us being brave I work in the transportation in the transportation team and like you say we do loads of stuff for active travel and sustainable travel and we really try in any any scheme even if it's a massive a major junction project we always try and put um the sustainable transport elements in that but i think sometimes we struggle to be as brave as we want to be um because things can get diluted because of um it may be that the, the members of the public haven't been taken on that journey um and or uh, so maybe there's things we need to do better but also like someone um was it gavin was saying earlier about the residents as well kind of any kind of comms we can do just to get to get that out so I think they were the kind of challenges I've, I've thought about with and whether it's members as well our ECC members um, so I know there's a lot of members that are really positive about this but sometimes um, it can be really tricky to get to get everyone on board so they are the kind of my challenges that I face and I'd be happy to speak to someone about it offline but um, no everything sounds really great but thank you. So um, if I could just come back up very quickly on the the, so there has been research done into this 
a kind of a balance between home working and transport and digital. on average um uh the the there are there is a common footprint to being online of course there is um but actually it is tiny compared to the transport footprint so you shouldn't worry the it should be the last thing on your list to worry about the the much bigger impact is actually the heating increased heating of people's homes and on balance it is still better to uh work virtually that's what the research says, but it's a fine balance. And actually, they just it puts more emphasis on the need to be more efficient at home because we're spending more time there. Um, but the, the the biggest lion's share of the carbon footprint is actually the balance with your home heating rather than your IT usage. Uh, on the transport and the behaviour change piece, I think this is absolutely one of the biggest challenges, getting people to travel differently. It's really tough. And I, I think we're right at the beginning of that conversation with residents. Um, yeah, I completely agree. Sam, can I just come in on some of the things that are on the chat? Because um, there are a couple of things there that were really interesting. Uh, one was about whether vegetarian um, is the best way or whether locally produced meat would be better and things like that. Um, it's certainly true that some of the headline figures for um, uh, the carbon impact, say, within um, uh, within the meat industry, are not uh, are not necessarily the same for local farmers. Uh, so they're a kind of an aggregate figure. Um, but generally, um, in terms of resources, uh, an animal will convert about one sixth of the vegetable protein that it consumes into meat protein. So so there are there are other savings that are hidden from that in the sense that if you eat the vegetable protein yourself um you're not losing five six of it so so there are particular savings in that but you're right to point out the thing that if you're then filling your sandwiches with um you know vegetables from kenya or something like that then then that's that's not helping so the principle that's often used is something called loaf uh which is local organic uh, animal friendly and fairly traded uh, one of the things that I can never understand and and I this is something I always go on to people who work for Essex County Council with is if I was in Essex County Council I want to I would want to see Essex produce being bigged up you know uh, the little cafe shouldn't be selling Smith's crisps they should be selling Fairfield's crisps you know, they should be selling stuff that's made in Essex. We're a brilliant county. We produce some excellent stuff. Let's go local and really big it up. Uh, and I just want to say something about transport, because one of the one of the conversations that we have to and fro, and particularly when you big up EVs, is that um, uh, if you're replacing your car and you look at the cost of EVs, EVs are out of the price range for many people. Um, and, and largely uh, the uh, we have a kind of company car as bishops, but actually very few electric vehicles on the company car list uh, because um, because they just cost too much. Um, but there are such gaps in our transport system that we need some form of transport. And um, I just want to advocate because I've had it now for four years. Um, I have this cracking little, this is an app that goes with it, a little electric moped takes me to the station and back, part for free in all sorts of places. It cost me with the government subsidy less than a thousand pounds. And uh, I've done quite a few miles on that now. Uh, it's all the trips that I would have done in a car when the car is working at its least economical um, and is a cracking way to get around. And I have to say, in terms of advocating, because that was the other thing, um, you know, what about what about the sort of wider public piece? I think how we live and what we do is a great way to to set an example for those around us. And and when you whistle by, sometimes I have to go togged up in all my bishop gear, but I'm there on my silent moped riding through Colchester. It turns heads in a way that if I was in a Ferrari, it wouldn't. And uh, and I have to say, live that example and let other people see what you're doing. Great. No, thanks. Very inspirational. And uh, yeah, sounds sounds like a great great little mode of transport there um i think we've got uh jill 
Hello, everyone, and a uh, fantastic session. Thank you very much. Um, very enlightening. Uh, I work for Adult Community Learning, and we've built into our courses sustainability elements. So in particular, the creatives, who are my champion team, um, they've been doing eco flowers. So all the floristry courses now use uh, environmentally friendly materials. We've got away, gone away from using Oasis, uh, the, the kinds of pots that are used, you know, use your old Wellington boots to create a floral display. Um, it, it, we're steering the whole curriculum in that direction because it's a ripple effect. The people who come to those classes suddenly see the opportunities that are there that where they can reuse things rather than bin things. Uh, so it, it sort of reduces the impacts, but it's, it's, it's a bigger message. And I see that James has got her hand up because she's instrumental in part of this move. Um, but we're, we're trying to build that into everything we do. So ESOL classes, there's a sustainability element in it. English classes, things about the climate, the environment that we live in and the impact we have on it. Yeah, that sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, Jane, did you want to come in if you're kind yeah, of... Yeah, I'm just going <laughs> to yeah. come in and follow up on what Jill was just saying. So... Um, uh, somebody asked about what there is for, for residents. So we have a, we are a retrofit academy uh, on the one hand at ACL, um, but we also have a level two that's open to learners or, on climate change. So there are things that we have that are specifically for um, for um, residents to come and learn about climate so that's one area that we can definitely support with um but as jill said we're also embedding across there's lots of stuff on our website as well that we're trying we do things like occasion we have things like top tips things that you can do like that list we had earlier um and really i think that's that's acl strength in this in this is is that education obviously side of things um so where people need support to get that message out we can definitely be party to that I think and also then I think there's there's room for us to work with other areas as well <clears throat> we also did things like um in terms of getting getting that information out to residents we did a, a climate change exhibition in Chelmsford Library last year I don't know if anyone popped in to see it when it was there um and we had learner pledges there so things around the same thing you know eating less meat what we were gonna that they were gonna do um to kind of make people think about it so there's lots of work we can do that reaches out to residents and and I'll do we're building on that all the time so yeah uh, yeah, that that all sounds fantastic. And um, yeah, Jill, it was interesting what you're saying with like the floristry courses and, and using sort of environmentally friendly materials now, which is amazing. And actually, we we will probably be in touch with you after this because it would be great to get some kind of case studies. This is all the kind of stuff that we really want to share on the network because there is undoubtedly so much stuff like this happening that we're just maybe not aware of. So this is why we kind of really want this network. Um, and I think it'd be a really good platform to share this. Equally, if you're doing things like this, you know, you don't need to come through uh, myself or one of the other um, owners of the network to post things. Feel free to just, you know, start a conversation, you know, a link to something your team has done, whatever, whatever you want, just just put it on there. But um, yeah, really, really great to hear about some of that work. Um, so I think this who else for the hand up? Thing that won the climate challenge. Yeah. I'm gonna move out of the way. <laughs> Um, excellent artwork produced for it oh yeah no yeah amazing yeah no yeah we'll, we'll, we'll pick all of this up because I think it would be really great to capture on the network so thank you um Dave I think you're next no oh, lovely thank you um yeah no uh, thanks to everyone who's just popped a, a response in on that power popped in there so um I'll take that away um the response was 97 percent of people said yes three percent no um, and the question was if there was an environmentally friendly plan that ECC staff could sign up to for your electricity and gas at home, would this be of interest? So I'll take that away and make that a little um, project to see what we can do. Um, obviously, I have to check with the legal to see if there's any implications or, but it sounds like it might be worth uh, investigating further if we can have a lot of people come together. Not only will we get a better price overall, given the, the cost of uh, energy now, but hopefully we can get a more environmentally sourced one as well. So watch this space, hopefully. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and again, um, it will be really interesting to see how you get on. Um, if you need any support from anybody 
in the environment and climate area, please shout. Um, equally, it'd be good to sort of get updates on this on the network. So um, yeah, sounds sounds great. Yeah, well done. Uh, thank you. Um, I think Gavin, you got your hand up. Uh, hello again. Um, just a quick note on tree planting. Um, so we have to be careful not to be disingenuous with our our numbers. Uh, I've noticed this across the UK, UK, across the world. We talk about how many trees we've planted, but actually um, we'd be looking at norm in a normal run, an 80% survival rate. Last year, across the board, we were looking, because those temperatures, we were looking about a 20% survival rate. So I think we, we could actually lead the way in representing the true figures of the trees that we planted and survive. Still have the same targets, but we've got to double our effort or quadruple our effort, I think. So that absolutely, Gavin, uh, we have made a commitment. So first of all, we mulch all our trees so we have a higher survival rate. But every tree that dies, we go back and replant. So our numbers are genuinely accurate. We do not leave um, dead trees. That's uh, we absolutely are committed to going back. And making sure our trees really are established under the Essex Forest Initiative. And uh, uh, if you find uh, planting that has failed, please let us know. You need to have a word with the highways people on the motorways. Well, that's national uh, highways and they are a whole different kettle of fish. <laughs> So has anybody got any other questions or anything? I think, Jane, you've got your hand up, but I'm not sure if that's an old hand from earlier. Sorry, yes, old hand. <laughs> old hand, no, no worries. <laughs> has anybody got anything else they would like to ask whilst here um, or anything they'd like to discuss? I mean, I just, uh, uh, I am very struck by that there's a lot of material in the chat um uh and i i think it's probably worth um us going through and linking up uh some people with kind of teams yeah. and just to emphasize if people aren't aware there is carbon literacy training available on my learning if you haven't done it please sign up um uh, and you will get your certificate and then you'll be certified carbon literate so if you haven't done that please please uh do do that yeah, and um, yeah, Sam mentioned we'll, we'll, we'll go back through the chat because, yeah, I can see there's loads of comments, which is yeah. amazing. Um, I'm not even going to try and pick my way through all of those now. Um, but yes, um, we will be in touch. Um, we'll be in touch for, you know, if we can offer support or sort of point in the, in the right direction. Um, OK, perfect. Well, if there's no more questions, um, then we will end the session there. Um, I hope that you found it useful. I hope that you've been inspired. Um, and yeah, thanks. Thanks all for joining. Uh, and and please continue to um, to promote the network and encourage more employees to join it. I think we've got over a hundred members, which is fantastic. But um, yeah, please. Please do keep your eyes peeled because we'll be continually posting and organising events. Um, but yeah, that that's everything from me. A massive thank you again to Bishop Roger, who's come along today to talk and to our other guest speakers and to Sam. Really in interesting to hear from everyone. So, yeah, thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks, Rosalind. And well done setting this up. It's a really good thing to do. Really, thanks. thanks for coming. <laughs>